Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Aaron Ragsdale. He's a new professor here in the Department of Integrative Biology. He's going to talk with us about a new model of human origins in Africa. I think he's got a slightly different um, title, but I like this one, which was the original one. <laughs> so we're going with that one. Um, this work was just published in June, on the June 13th issue of Nature. It's not every week that we have a talk based on research published in Nature. Uh, Aaron, I get to ask you the five questions I ask everybody. You can answer in any way that you would like. The standard line is, the answers don't have to be true, they just have to be believable. <laughs> oh, by the way, Aaron and I used to be neighbors until Aaron and his partner bought a house and moved six or seven miles away, no, a mile and a half away. Um, and that's how I met Aaron, so I get to ask questions that I think I might know the answers to. Aaron, where were you born? Born in Olympia, Washington. Olympia, Washington. Mm -hmm. And which came first, the beer or the Olympia? The Olympia. <laughs> All right. And then where'd you go to high school? Uh, North Thurston High School. And is that in Olympia? Close. Oh, close enough. Close enough. <laughs> and then where'd you go for your undergrad and what did you study? So I went to University of Portland in Portland, Oregon. I studied math. And then where'd you go for your advanced degrees, and what did you study? I went to the University of Arizona. I went to the Applied Math Department, although the Applied Math Department lets you have an advisor in, in kind of any related field, so I worked with somebody in molecular, molecular biology. Ooh. And did you get a master's and a PhD, or go straight yeah, through? Yeah, PhD there. Good. And did you postdoc anywhere? Yes, I did. I postdoc in, in Canada, in Montreal, at McGill University. Um, and so this work is coming from started when I was when I was there in, at McGill, and then I did a short postdoc in in Mexico uh, before coming here. Great, and then when did you arrive at UW Madison? Fall twenty twenty one. Good. Two years ago. I'm looking forward to this. Would you please join me in welcoming Aaron Ragsdale to Wednesday night at the lab? Thanks so much, Tom, and thanks everybody for being here. It's nice to see a, a nice crowd here, and, and hello to everybody in the virtual world. Um, uh, and yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be talking about a new model for human origins in Africa. You can ignore this title if you'd like. Um, uh, but first, I thought I'd tell you a little bit, since this is Wednesday night at the lab, I'll tell you a little bit about, about our lab and what we study. Um, and so we, we primarily work on kind of broadly this question of how genome biology, uh, population processes, ecology, how all these factors combine uh, to shape genetic diversity of populations and of species. And then kind of on the other side of that is, is asking about how the, the effects of, what are the effects of that genetic diversity um, on the evolution and adaptations of populations and species. And so this isn't a, a biochemical or your typical biological lab. Um, there's no, uh, no chemicals in this lab unless, unless you consider caffeine a, chem a chemical. Um, so we're entirely computational. We, we develop mathematical methods um, and software to analyze genomic data. Um, and, and mostly we, we, ap we apply this or study this to um, human genetics and human evolution, but not, not entirely. And so when we're thinking about human evolution, um, we have kind of these, these big, long-standing questions uh, that, that, you know, that typically get asked. So, you know, obviously, the biggest question, where and when did our species emerge, um, say, as, as, quote, modern Homo sapiens? Um, what was the distribution of early human, po human populations before we expanded across the globe? Uh, what, what's the relationship of those early populations to each other? How are they related to people living today? And, and also, what's our relationship 
relationship to other hominid species that existed at the same time as those early populations. So when, where, to what extent were there genetic exchanges, say, between um, distantly, genetic, distantly related homo lineages? Okay, so these are kind of the, bi the big questions, I would say, in, uh, in human evolution that we're going to, we're not going to answer all of them tonight, but hopefully we'll, we'll hint at some answers to some of them. Uh, and give you some ideas about how, how we might go about answering these questions along the way. Um, and so, but before we talk about genetic data and how genetics is used to answer these questions, um, so long before there was genetic data really available to contribute to answering these questions, it, it was really anthropologists, uh, paleontologists, they were, they were locked in this debate um, really about the timing and mode of the, of the emergence of, of Homo sapiens among hominin lineages. And most arguments that were made um, necessarily were based on archaeological and fossil data. Right? So, and the fossil record would show that um, Homo species were in Africa for uh, many millions of years, and that there, were, and that there are sites and, and fossils that are attributed to um, certain Homo species dating to up to about two million years ago outside of Africa, for example, in, uh, uh, in East Asia. And there are actually quite a few uh, fossil remains across Africa and Eurasia um, that really, they, I mean, you have a fossil that you find, it unambiguously tells you where some Homo species was living at some time, um, although the dating of those, those fossils can be kind of tricky. Um, and much of the arguments of the last century was really, was really based on trying to tie together the, you know, draw strings and draw arrows in between the, um, between these sites that have been found to try to tie together how they're all related to each other and how species might have evolved over time um, and given rise to the many hominin species that we know existed over the last. So early debates, I would say, from the mid to the late 20th century, they, they centered around this question of whether there were kind of two competing hypotheses, the first being um, perhaps homo, uh, homo sapiens, so humans evolved in a loosely connected manner across Africa and Eurasia. Um, and that this evolution was largely independent for many hundreds of thousands of years. This is, this is uh, uh, often called the multi-regional model. Um, and, the, and the alternative hypothesis is that we, we trace all our ancestry back to a fairly recent common ancestor that lived, lived within Africa, where our species evolved into, say, modern Homo sapiens and then later dispersed across the world, largely replacing the hominin species that previously existed. And so you, you could imagine these um, competing hypotheses being depicted uh, in these conceptual models that, that might, uh, might look something like this, where you have kind of tubes and arrows that represent populations over time, uh, maybe with, for, for here, going from time going from bottom to top, where you might have the relationship between you know, populations existing in different regions. Uh, and these might be ways that you can conceptualize these different competing hypotheses. And they can get rather, rather complicated, like this, like these web of arrows on the on the left. Um, but I think what's important about these about these different hypotheses is they give us different predictions about what to expect in both fossil and also diversity data, so di so morphological and genetic diversity. Um, and so, so just to highlight a few of these, you might have um, predictions about the geographic distribution of fossils. Uh, representing the human ancestors. Um, or you might have predictions about uh, morphological or genetic differences that you would expect to see between past <coughs> or present human populations. And I would say ent until the 1980s, it was, it's, it, at least looking back, it appears to me the multi-regional model uh, was the leading hypo hypothesis among paleoanthropologists. And so to make it a little bit more concrete, the, the Multi-regional model would, would say something along the lines of, um, say, Neanderthals were the direct ancestors of present-day humans in, in Europe. In, Europe. Um, in East Asia, maybe Homo erectus or, or a related regional group were the direct ancestors there, likewise within Africa. And technologies, cultures, genetics would have evolved locally um, with only intermittent, connect, intermittent connections between these, between these regions. Um, and it was around the 1980s or 90s that, that 
opinions really began to, uh, began to shift. Um, and this was mostly due to, to greatly improved methods for dating fossil remains. Um, and so prior to this, it was, everything was really based on radiocarbon dating, which only, is, only works to the last tens of, tens of hundreds of thousands of years or so. And so around this, around this time, new non-radiocarbon dating methods are, um, were, were coming on the scene, and they're much, much more accurate to much, much older times. Um, and this led to a, a kind of a drastic revision of a lot of the dates of, of different fossils in archaeological sites, um, of kind of the relevant, of those relevant fossils that have been found around, around the world. Um, so all of a sudden, uh, dates of humans living outside of Africa were, were revised, so we know that modern humans were, say, in Israel before 100,000 years ago. Um, and at the same time, uh, you have uh, other sites in Israel uh, that, that show that Neanderthals were also there, so coinciding with humans at the same time and actually existing beyond the time that modern humans were there. And so this really kind of upends the chronology of, of, of the multi-regional model if you had Neanderthals evolving into Homo sapiens, if they're evolving, or if they're living in the same place at the same time or even uh, swapped around. So it, it turns the chronology on the head, and so it really makes you makes you um, reconsider the these uh, these different hypotheses. And and so in addition to these breakthroughs in dating of sites and fossils, um, really genetic material was was first being sequenced in humans from around the world. Um, and this this provided a really a really powerful tool that I think. Um, kind of closed the book on the multi-regional model once and for all. And the first, the first sequencing data that was, that was generated and, and compared across humans from around the world was uh, mitochondrial DNA. And so the mitochondria was the first uh, bits of DNA to be sequenced because it's so much more abundant in the cells than, than the nuclear DNA. And so, so it was much more, you know, the, for the sequencing technologies of the time, it was easier to get mitochondrial DNA from, from many samples. Um, and with this mitochondrial DNA, what we can build are these gene trees or um, gene genealogies. And so these genealogies or these trees are reconstructed by comparing the similarities and differences between, uh, say, two or more say, mitochondrial genomes that you would look at. Um, and so if you have two DNA sequences that are very similar to each other, there are not many mutations between them, you infer that they have a recent common ancestor. Whereas if they have many, many differences between them, you would put their recent common ancestry at a much older time. So if you look at many of them all together, you can build these really kind of elaborate trees of how all these mitochondrial genomes are, are related to each other. And the depth of this tree would relate to how far in the past they found a common ancestor. Okay. And what these trees showed was that, that really all humans share a recent common ancestry. Um, that it wasn't, it wasn't millions of years old or even many hundreds of thousands of years old. It was within maybe the last 200,000 years that the, that the, 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 deepest, com the, the deepest ancestors on this tree. Right. Um, the data was limited. It's, only just, it's just one locus in the genome. There's, there's some variability, so it doesn't tell us exactly, and it doesn't tell us exactly where those ancestors live, so it doesn't answer everything. So it kind of puts a, I think puts a nail in the coffin of the, um, of the multi-regional model. But really the definitive kind of evidence for the uh, origins of humans in Africa and recent dispersal was, uh, would come with the sequencing of whole human, uh, whole human genomes, so the whole autosome of humans in the early 2000s, um, and the sequencing of many genomes from many people from around the world. Um, and it really quickly became clear that the well, a few, a few obvious, um, or a few, a few clear pictures emerged from this. Uh, one is that the highest levels of genetic diversity are found within Africa, and diversity decreases as you look at populations that move farther away from Africa. So this kind of suggests a, an expansion from a, say, a, a ancestral center of the uh, ancestral range of humans being in Africa with a more recent dispersal out of Africa. And we'll kind of think a little bit of why Later on into today, we'll talk a little bit how put this a little bit more concretely. 
And so there's it's kind of a, a, very, a really rapid shift in, in, um, uh, in the support for the, for the hypothesis of this great human expansion that is, that is a recent expansion from, um, uh, from out of Africa. And so this would, this would show actually that even those oldest remains of, of nearly modern humans that were found in Israel around 100 to 120,000 years ago, um, they, they were, so they were there, it, but, they, but it appears that it, they did not leave any descendants um, and that they were actually replaced again by the Neanderthals more recently. And the expansion out of Africa that, that leads to the ancestry of most people living outside of Africa today um, really dates to about maybe 75, 60 um, or so thousand years ago. Um, probably closer to 60 or 70,000 years, although that's, that's a little bit debated still. But the big picture was kind of, was kind of solved, it was thought at the time. Um, and so you have this picture of, of an expansion out of Africa and a subsequent uh, colonization of the globe. Um, and really all that was left to kind of refine these model parameters, refine the dates of how this happened, maybe refine what was going on locally, but the big picture was kind of, was kind of clear. Um, and then there's the obvious question of course, uh, where do our distant cousins fit into this picture? Those, those Neanderthals and other hominin species, um, where they're kind of shoved out of the picture all of a sudden, right? So where do they actually fit in with this? Um, well, the first genetics again tells us a little bit of a clue about this. Uh, the first sequencing of Neanderthal DNA was again the mitochondria, because mitochondrial DNA was more abundant and in those fossils and easier to sequence. And this happened actually as far back as 1997. Um, and if you compare the Neanderthal mitochondrial to all living humans, it's pretty distant re distantly related, at least four, a time, four or five times more distantly related than any human is from each other. So they, they fall way outside kind of the, the tree of, of modern humans. And so this was taken as evidence that humans and Neanderthals were distinct distinct non-interbreeding species at the time. Although it was, I'll just point out that uh, Magnus Nordberg and just, uh, just a year later quickly pointed out that this, this observation could just be due to chance, that there could be other loci in the genome that are more closely related to Neanderthals. Um, so this result is actually inconclusive, he thought. And it turns out that uh, his observation proved to be, to be rather prescient because uh, well, and well before, his, well before uh, the time that it was actually solved, because it wouldn't be until over a decade later that the, that the full sequence of the Neanderthal autosome was sequenced. Um, uh, this was sequenced by uh, Svante Pablo's team. Um, and from this, it was clear that the history was more complicated than, than this uh, simple outgroup that was not interbreeding with humans. Um, and especially in Eurasian populations, some, some parts of the genome did appear, did appear to be more closely related to Neanderthals than, than like the mitochondria was. So this suggests a more complicated uh, relationship between Neanderthals and humans. And this name might be familiar, he just won the Nobel Prize for, for this work. Um, although I will point out that there's always a lot of, a lot of people involved in these big projects. Um, these teams can, can consist of dozens of people from collecting data, uh, analyzing data, working with the fossils, sequencing, and all sorts of stuff, right? So these are big monumental efforts. Um, and uh, I think the award is well deserved, but there's a whole team that is behind it. So, so where's the Neanderthal in the second Germany? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's in Germany. That's, they're named Neanderthals because the first the first fossil of Neanderthals was found in Neander Valley, and in German, Tau is Valley. Right, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. so, so the outcome of this recontact with Neanderthals, this interbreeding, um, what it results in is bits of DNA that is scattered, scattered in the genomes of living, uh, living individuals, um, and they carry, those little bits of DNA are more closely related to Neanderthals or carry those mutations that arose in the Neanderthal lineage um, instead of in the human lineage. And so you have 
some bits of, some little fragments. So what this is showing is uh, a sp every spike is a little fragment along chromosome 9 where, where an individual of European ancestry um, looks to carry the Neanderthal mutation instead of the human mutation. Okay. And most, individual, most individuals in the world carry some Neanderthal-like segments, um, but they're mostly found in, in non-African populations. And there isn't really all that much of it. It's really only one or two percent in most non-African populations. And the total amount can vary among individuals, um, as do the locations in the genome where, they, where, they, where you might find a Neanderthal segment in an individual. Um, but there's enough of it to really reconstruct this, these more complicated models of splits that maybe occurred 600,000 years ago or so, and more recent recontacts that are represented by these arrows between between, say, Neanderthals into humans or vice versa. And so you get this really complicated picture um, from looking at the sharing of these, of these genetic segments among individuals. Yeah. And so we've now updated, our, updated again our model of human history. Instead of a, a, a simple tree where Denisovans and Neanderthals would be outside of the, of the orbit or the sphere of modern humans, you now have these kind of reticulations, these uh, connections that make loops in this tree. Right? So it gets a bit more complicated. And it only, and, and our picture of human history is only becoming more and more complicated. Uh, this, is, this is helped by the sequencing of many individuals, including many ancient individuals. So um, they maybe lived only a couple hundred, hundred years ago or thousands, maybe ten thousands, tens of thousands. Um, and also just the sequencing of a massive number of living individuals. Um, all this data is really letting us reconstruct intricacies of, of human history. And it's especially true for Eurasian populations. A lot of focus has been on, uh, especially for ancient DNA in, in Europe, in colder climates where DNA has been preserved a lot better and also where there's just been more, more effort expended to, to, to extract it and sequence it. And so we get these, I'm showing you a lot of kind of these different ways of, of depicting these kind of histories. And so this is a, another way of, you know, where you have tubes and arrows and you get this really complicated kind of network of, of populations with splits and recontacts. And what I want to point out here is that what's, what's, lar what's largely missing from these pictures of human evolution is any understanding of the details of of the diversity in history that's occurring within Africa. Right? So everything that I haven't highlighted in, in uh, teal here uh, is outside of Africa. And just, this, just these, these little branches are, are the history of Africa. Right? This is a vast over, oversimpli oversimplification. We know that human populations across Africa are incredibly diverse that there's a complex history of, of structure, migrations, dynamics, just like everywhere else in the world, um, both before and after the global expansion of humans. But the prevailing, the prevailing models of, especially of, uh, maybe a decade or eight years ago, um, really captured none of this complexity. So, so what are some of the things that went on during our evolution within Africa? Most of the evolution of of humans occurred within Africa, after all. Um, well, we know that there were different species of, of, of humans, or humans more broadly, so other homo species within Africa that, were, that coexisted at the same time. Um, and there is some genetic evidence for possible archaic admixture within African populations. This was pointed out as far back as 2006 by some researchers. Um, yeah, we know that there were different groups, different hominin groups within Africa over the past million years. We have fo some fossils from them um, that are, uh, I'm sure some of you in the audience have, uh, have heard John Hawkes talk about Homo naledi that was found at the Rising Star system in South Africa. That's a recent discovery of, of another Homo species that, that coexisted with, with Homo sapiens within Africa. Um, and, and we also know there's some recent work that shows that if we model mixtures between some unknown or ghost population, um, maybe something that instead of having 
a tree like this where everything on the right, right hand side uh, out here is, I should point with the cursor for the people online. Everything out here is outside of Africa. If uh, instead of just having this one, one branch, if you have sort of some, some extra branch that adds a loop within Africa that might represent contact with another hominin species, it does a better job at, at describing the genetic diversity. So there is some evidence that there's more, co there's more complicated stuff going on than just a single branch with, uh, without any sort of complexity. And so these, these types of analyses that I just showed, they, they typically contrast two competing models of human history. And so I'm gonna show this figure a few times to kind of keep track of kind of the conceptual models that we're, that we're gonna be exploring here. Um, you, you, they typically contrast something like a, a recent expansion where you have, say, a diversification of, of populations across Africa followed by the uh, uh, followed by an out of Africa event with, um, with con where there was contact with Neanderthals. Um, or maybe there's an additional, kind of akin to the Neanderthal story in Europe and the Near East. You might, have, you might have an archaic branch that comes back into contact with one or more of these, of these branches within Africa too. Right? So these are the kind of the types of models that get compared. Um, However, these, these really aren't the only possible scenarios that we could imagine. You can imagine, just to, just to have a few extra ideas, there might be um, populations that existed within Africa that when kind of the, maybe the modal or the main branch of, of humans expanded, they kind of absorbed those local populations, and so you have uh, population structure that is maintained there. Or maybe you have really long-lasting long -lasting population structure, so long lo splits that occurred long ago that were may maybe or maybe not connected by gene flow. So there are a lot of different ways that you could think about how, how humans existed over say the last 500,000 years, million years um, within Africa. And this is a little bit reminiscent of these early debates of multi-regionalism versus single origin or these other kind of conceptual models when we were thinking about kind of the evolution of humans across the Eastern Hemisphere, Eastern Hemisphere, but now we're kind of thinking within Africa. Right? So there's kind of a, a, a connection um, to those early conceptual models. So the goals here are, we wanna, we wanna learn historical models um, that do a better job of describing genetic diversity among present day individuals. So we wanna do a better job of describing just doing a better job of predicting that genetic diversity in a place that we know that there is a lot of genetic diversity and diversity among populations. And in the process, we wanna narrow down the possible historical models of early human history uh, within Africa. And some questions to keep in mind that we might not, might not have clear answers for at the end, but I think are, are always nice to, uh, to think about is what do these different models imply about say the geography or the ecology um, or movement of human populations across the geographic range over time. They kind of imply different, um, different ways that humans were existing and interacting. Um, and can we link these or how might these be connected to archeological um, archaeological data um, or other, other features such as um, climate history, um, the history of habitable regions versus inhabitable regions uh, over the past million years. And so we have maybe kind of these really complicated models of, of what might be going on uh, drawn in these kind of conceptual ways. We wanna test these different models and compare how each of them, how well each of them do at, at capturing the genetic diversity of, of people that we see living today. So the approach that we took in, uh, in, the, in the work that I'll be talking about for the rest of, uh, the rest of this evening is, is that we used sequencing data from, from present day individuals um, in populations from across uh, Western, Eastern, and Southern Africa. So I'm highlight, highlighting a few, of them, uh, a few of them here, as well as um, some proxies for the out of Africa or the non-African population. So including uh, 
the British population, um, as well as Vindigia, which is a, a sequenced Neanderthal. So we can compare also to Neanderthal genomes that, we, um, that have been sequenced. And so by including these groups with, with diverse ancestries and ge diverse geographies, we, we really hope to, to narrow, narrow down some of these conceptual models. And just to, to first give you a kind of a picture of the, a snapshot of the genetic diversity among, among these groups, um, you could look at kind of these descriptive, uh, descriptive approaches of describing genetic diversity. So on the top here, each dot here would be an individual in, the, in what's called a principal component analysis, or a PCA which dots that are closer together indicate that those, those individuals share more genetically than dot, dots that are farther apart. And these, these axes are, are meant to capture kind of the, the main, main axes of variation among, uh, uh, among, among the genetic variation that we see. And what you see is populations that are nearby regionally, they share more in common genetically, um, but there's a lot of genetic diversity Across, across Africa. So here are the British out here, and then this, this is all um, capturing the, the genetic diversity among populations within Africa. Or you can, each bar here is rep also representing one of the individuals in the data set. And you see that there's a lot of variability in if you, if you were to use an algorithm to say paint the ancestry of an individual's genome, um, some individual, there's some, indi some populations have maybe what looks like mixture between two or more populations, um, and there's even a lot of variability within populations. Right? So there's a lot of variation within populations, a lot of variation between populations. Okay, so what, what's the general strategy that we'll take to learn these, say, kind of extract historical parameters that we can actually learn from genetic data? Um, well, the first step is to maybe take people sequence them and, and somehow summarize the genetic diversity that we see in those populations in a meaningful way. So we want to get meaningful statistics of, of, of genetic diversity from the sequencing data. And then we want to take these conceptual models and kind of turn them into parameters that we can test. So these parameters might be what are population sizes over time, when did those split times occur, what were subsequent migration rates between populations or fractions of, of of, uh, of ancestry in a, in, a, in a more recent admixture event, these sorts of things. Right? And we take these parameters from these, from these models that we, uh, that we draw out. We, we have mathematical models or computational models um, where we can simulate or predict, uh, predict these same statistics that we've extracted from, from the sequencing data that we have. So we have a model where we can get predictions for those statistics, and then we have data where we have those statistics. And so the, the goal is to, to compare the data to the model predictions and try to find, try to tune those parameters, those population sizes, the split times, that provides a good fit between the model predictions and the data. Right? So this is a, a standard statistical inference approach that we'll, that we'll be taking to compare model predictions to observations from the data. And maybe the simplest summary or simplest statistic of the data is something like the, the total number of mutations that we observe among individuals in each population, or maybe the probability that a given site in a genome <coughs> is, is variable, has a mutation or not, right? So meaning whether there's two or more of the ACGT alleles at a site, or if there's just one at a site. And what we see from this is Yes, compared to the rest of non-African populations, African populations have, do carry more genetic variation. Um, and this is the scale here. There's maybe, maybe 15 or 20 percent higher genetic variation uh, in West African populations than in, maybe, in many non-African populations. And so this is a well, you know, this is a, a well-known a well observation in genetic data. And so we want to build, maybe build a model for how do we, how do we predict those le levels of genetic variation so that we, could, so that we can compare to a picture like this. Right? Um, and so this, 
this uh, description of genetic diversity that we'll, that we'll be thinking about a little bit is it's a fundamental, of, fundamental measure of genetic variation. Um, we'll call it pairwise diversity. And so what this means is maybe we sample two genome copies from a group. They could be the two diploid copies in, in a single individual or two copies from two different individuals. And we can count the number or the, or the proportion of sites that are just different between those two individuals. Right? So this is sometimes called heterozygosity, if you've, if you've heard that term. Um, I'll use the term pairwise diversity because we'll be maybe comparing within an individual or across individuals. And if we look at, say, predictions from, from simple models of, of population history, um, maybe our models would predict higher, uh, higher per base pair um, pairwise diversity in African populations than in non-African populations. And so how would we model this process to get these predictions? Well, one, maybe the simplest thing to do is, is we, uh, we simulate a population size of, of n individuals, and there are two n genome copies because there are, because we're diploids, so we have two genome copies per person, um, and we might just simulate the process of, of reproduction and mutations over time and see how the population, the composition of pairwise diversity changes in the population over time. If we want to get heterozygosity from this or pairwise diversity, we could take a generation um, sample, draw two of the copies from it, and just check, are they different or not? Right? And that would give you a, a, a number for the probability of whether they are different or not based on the, based on the model that you've plugged into your computer and, and simulated. Right? Um, so, well, almost a century ago now, um, Saul Wright showed, so Saul Wright has a connection to so Madison, he's a famous population geneticist who spent uh, the later, later years of his time after University, University of Chicago here. Um, he showed that there's an elegant way of doing this without having to model the entire population, which is actually computationally pretty expensive. Since we're just comparing two copies, um, we can just keep track of the two copies and see how they change over time. And the way you would do this is say, well, you can keep track of two lineages over time and in any given generation, there's a chance that you might have uh, found siblings in the same generation. And if you have a sibling where, you've, where you're both inherited from the same parent, um, that's what we would call a coalescent event. You found a common ancestor in the previous generation, and by necessity, you have to share the same mutation. Right? So if, you, if the lineages you were tracking were different before, then all of a sudden they were siblings, then they had to be the had to share the same, same allele. And this is, in this process, you have a, a reduction in the, in the pairwise diversity over time. Because just every so often, you're gonna be sampling, sampling siblings or something like that. So these coalescent events reduce genetic variation. And of course, they're reintroduced. You have variation that's reintroduced through mutations. So every, every generation with, say, a mutation rate u, there's a chance that one of your two lineages might mutate again and they'll be different again. Right. So you can write down a very simple model for, for how this pairwise diversity changes over time. It decays due to drift or these coalescent events and then it increases uh, due to mutation. So you have this, you can, you can sometimes, um, well, you can sometimes find a balance between these two. If a population is at steady state, um, the rate that redu the reduction of, of pairwise diversity over time due to these coalescent events might cancel out the increase in variation due to new mutations. Uh, and so you can take this equation and rearrange it a little bit. So if, if heterozygosity is not changing over time, we can just replace it with this, a constant h I can move things around in this equation and write this, this well-known equation for expected heterozygosity, expected pairwise diversity, um, which is the product of the population size and the mutation rate. So this is a, uh, a well-known result in population genetics, which relates diversity in a population to how big that population is. 
bigger populations are expected to have higher diversity. And so if we look back at our plots of heterozygosity or, or pairwise diversity in, in different populations, um, this which suggests to us that at least on average over long periods of time, the West African populations were larger than Eurasian populations, which makes sense if they went through a, a bottleneck as, as there was an expansion out of Africa. And if we look, if we compare those to the Neanderthals, the Neanderthals had much reduced pairwise diversity. And so we might, exp we might predict that their population size was much, much smaller. And if we do some more complicated modeling of, of how these population sizes have changed over time, so going from the past to the present, um, these red and these, this red and black lines are Neanderthal and Denisovan groups, two archaic groups, and they had a population crash maybe around 500 or 600,000 years ago um, and, and maintained low population sizes for, for quite a long time. And so that's reflected in their low pairwise diversity. And so I mentioned these, the non-African populations having lower, pop, lower diversity, and this is what's, what's known as a founder event. So these occur when, say, a small portion of, of a population splits off, um, expands into a previously uninhabited region. Uh, the descendants of those founders um, will carry just a subset of the genetic diversity of the, of the source population. And if this happened in kind of a serial way, you would have a serial reduction of of diversity. Um, and so that's reflected in the fact that you see lower, lower diversity as you move away from Africa in those populations. And so this, this evidence for the direction of expansion is from these successive reductions in diversity for populations far from Africa. And I won't go through the math of this, but you can, always, you can extend these models to think about multiple populations by, by sampling from multiple from, say, two different groups and comparing their genomes. And when you do this, you can see that uh, Europeans and East Asians are a little bit more closely related to each other than either of them are to West Africans. So that suggests that they split more recently than either of them split from, from African groups. And if we look at even further, when we compare all our humans to Neanderthals, well, we can zoom in. It's, it's not a strong, si well, it's, it doesn't look like a strong signal from here, but if we zoom in, we can see that Eurasians versus Neanderthals are a little bit more closely related than West Africans and Neanderthals. It's a small but noticeable difference, um, but this is what resulted from that contact that occurred maybe 50,000 years ago that has left one or two percent of uh, Eurasian ancestry um, that traces its traces its lineage through the Neanderthal branch, through, the, through that recontact. So this is, so I've talked a lot about Neanderthals. That's outside of Africa. Um, we we're interested in this question of what's going on within Africa. And we don't have DNA sequence from, say, some diverged hominin that, that could have been the source of this, of this admixture. So we have, say, an unsampled or unknown branch. And when we don't have data from, from the source population, it can be really difficult to, uh, to, really, to, get, to get to the bottom of these, of these past admixture events. And I want to remind us that we don't have any DNA, da DNA data from, from any of these fossils. And so it's going to be, we're going to have to come up with a different, a different approach to, um, to learning about population structure within Africa. Um, and so what we're going to do is make use of additional Additional summaries of the genetic diversity, um, not just looking at, say, pairwise diversity or allele frequencies at single sites, but we can think about correlations of alleles at linked sites in the genome. And when I talk about correlations of alleles, I want us to think about how mutations are actually physically located somewhere on our chromosome. And mutations that are close together, say, on a, on a given chromosome, during meiosis, they tend to be inherited together. Um, and those, those correlations break down um, sometimes it, for very close, closely linked mutations, maybe quite slowly, as you need recombination events. If we think back to our, uh, to our genetics course, um, we need recombination to break, across those break apart those correlations over time. 
So if I have this maybe diagram of a population that diverged and then reintroduced um, some genetic, some uh, ancestry to our sampled population, we could think about maybe mutations that occur along branches that go through that tree or through that section of the, of the plot. So maybe the star mutations are mutations that are accumulated in the, say, maybe in the Neanderthal branch or in this unknown archaic hominin branch and then reintroduced. And then so if we sample our individuals, maybe some of them would carry those star mutations, but most of them would not. If this, if this, if this admixture occurred at low levels, we'd only expect those star mutations to be quite rare. But they'll be found together on the same bits of DNA until recombination breaks them apart and mixes them. Right? So by using this information about the correlations, we might be able to learn a little bit about uh, pictures that look like this without actually having to have DNA from these, from these source groups. And so this was, this was much of my postdoc work with Simon Gravel at, M at McGill. Um, it was building models to, to think about these types of processes. So we have, we have kind of, I want to keep in mind this, this kind of picture, thinking about correlations between rare alleles coming from this type of process. Um, I just want to show how these models in general are, are quite useful for thinking about human history. So if we have, you know, this, this figure goes back over 100 years to when Thomas Hunt Morgan was first thinking about uh, crossovers and flies. Um, I think that's what it was. Um, so you have maybe two different two different genome copies during meiosis, they exchange, uh, exchange segments and you get kind of a mosaic of, of ancestry in the, uh, in the gametes that are passed on. Um, you can maybe compare this to, say, ancestry segments in, um, in admixed populations, say an admixed Mexican individual um, that has ancestry from, well, primarily um, Native American and European ancestry, but also African ancestry perhaps East Asian ancestry. Um, and we can see how, there's, how this process of recombination, and if you paint the ancestries, you can map it back onto, you know, each bar here is, is one of the chromosome copies. And you can see that it's a, it's a mosaic of ancestries on the genome. And how big those, how big those segments are, how many of them are, gives you an idea about maybe how long ago in the past admixture occurred and in what proportions um, you have admixture from each, from each of the source populations. Um, and so this is work um, uh, done jointly in my lab from, from Santiago Medina, who's a, who's a student in, uh, uh, in the same Mexican institute that I, that I did a postdoc in. Um, so he combined distributions of allele frequencies like pairwise diversity along with these ancestry segments to learn really detailed histories of, of recently admixed populations. And so by using this kind of combined information that, in, that includes this, these ancestry tracks, these ancestry segments, and their distributions, we can learn really detailed models of, of when admixture occurred um, and admi even admixture histories over time for these, pro for these different groups. And I'm pointing this out because it doesn't have much to do about stuff that happened in the very distant past. This is, these are events that occurred in the last 500 to 600 years. Um, but the underlying concept, concepts are not so different um, than, when, than when we're thinking about ar archaic admixture. Um, the main difference is that those ancestry segments are gonna be really, really tiny because recombination, there's been many generations of recombination breaking them apart. Um, and if there's been low levels of, of of gene flow from Neanderthals, so they're, they're going to be, um, there's gonna be less of it in total. Um, so that work that I did during my postdoc was, was to try to come up with mathem mathematical models just like Sol Wright did for pairwise diversity to describe correlations between alleles and, and capture this process. And I'm not gonna go into any of this, but just to point out that we have many different statistics uh, about the haplotype configurations among rare alleles, common alleles, et cetera, in two populations, three populations, as many populations as you want. So really lets you kind of have a flexible tool for looking at correlations among mutations in really complex models. 
And what you get is a, a system of equation that's really, really rapid to compute with a computer. You can extend it to many populations. And when you look at, when you compare the predictions from these models to data, so the data here are dots, so these correlation among common alleles versus correlation among rare, rare alleles. Our existing models that don't have archaic admixture do a really good job at describing common alleles, but they don't do a, a good job at all at describing the correlations among rare alleles. So they're not capturing this pattern of, of haplotypes carrying these rare intragrest, intragrest alleles. And then, maybe it's not surprising, once you add these branches where you have say deep divergences, deep divergences from the, Neanderth the Neanderthals with say gene flow between them more recently, you all of a sudden really perfectly capture these correlations between rare alleles. And this is without even needing DNA from the Neanderthal branch to be, to be able to, to capture this pattern. And if you wanna also capture the, uh, the pattern in say West African populations, you need to include some sort of structure within Africa to be able to explain the data as well. So we can update our, our model of human history again. Maybe there's another branch here with a bunch of question marks. Right? There's, there's a bit more complicated stuff going on parallel or within this branch, right? which isn't that surprising. So uh, to conclude with the results from the most recent paper and, and leave us with a, a, few, a few thoughts about it, I want to remind us that we're using, more recently, we're using geographically and genetically diverse populations. We're explicitly testing these different conceptual models, and so this is, this is work that, um, that I undertook with, with my postdoc, advi postdoc advisor, Simona, as well with our collaborator, Brenna Hen at UC Davis. And I'm gonna skip the gory details of any of this stuff. We're running out of time, and also it was uh, about half a decade of my life that I don't wanna <laughs> rehash. <laughs> but but we, we, we tested you know, more configurations that I wanna think about, but I'll get to the punchline and, and there's, there's, a bit to, there's quite a bit to take away at first glance at these models, so I'm, so I'm gonna walk through some of the consistencies and maybe differences. Um, but we found at least two historical models that did a, a really good job at fitting the data. And so let's look at the, at the recent history first, say the, the past 100,000 years. It's really consistent across every model that we've tested. Um, you have structure among present day populations that dates back only to about 120,000 years. And so even the most diverged populations, say Khoisans, the Nama in South Africa, and European populations, or, or East or West African populations, they find common ancestry around 100 or 120,000 years ago. Um, but prior to 120,000 years, it, it wasn't just a simple single pipe, right? You have also a population structure that existed then. It's just that around 120,000 years ago, there was kind of a reshuffling of the structure. Maybe there was a, a large coalescence, maybe an expansion where they all met each other and, and fragmented again. Um, but there was some sort of reshuffling that took place. And there is population structure that existed before. And the inference of that population structure, what did it look like? Well, it depends a lot on, on how you parameterize the model. Um, they look quite different. Um, but the consistencies are that there's more than just uh, or there's more than just one stem population, there are two or more. And importantly, they're, they're connected by ongoing migration. So they weren't isolated from each other, but they were connected by migration, at least, at least rough, fairly periodic recontact between these groups. And this contrasts with a, with a model of archaic admixture, which would, which would suggest that there's um, well, before I get to that, this ongoing contact would mean that the genetic diversity among these, among these stem populations, these two or more stem populations, diversity, or the differences weren't so high. And so they were probably genetically quite similar to each other. And the implication is that they would be morphologically quite similar to each other. Um, and it contrasts with, with our archaic admixture models that where if you have implied isolation, you would expect large differences to accumulate if they've been isolated from each other. And if you have large genetic differences, you might expect to see larger morphological differences. And so to wrap up, we wanna use these models to help interpret the fossil and archeological records. 
um, the genetic similarity among our ancestral populations, well, they imply that they would have been morphologically similar, so, so maybe the really morphologically diverse uh, fossils that we find, say Homo naledi, they probably didn't represent ancestral populations to humans. They were probably a coexisting species, but that did not interbreed with, with early modern victims. Whereas some of the other populations that were, that were more morpho morphologically similar or that fit within kind of the, and the envelope of, of morphological diversity among humans might, might have, could very well have, rep may, might very well represent ancestral populations, at least some of them. And it also helps, helps us interpret the archaeological record. And so the archaeological record shows that there was, there, was regional, there was a lot of regional variation in material cultures across Africa, so um, that have all been associated with, with potential Homo sapiens ancestors. Um, but there were major transitions, such as the predominant use of hand axes to uh, core techniques or, or, half, or hafting. These occurred roughly around the same time across Africa, and so this might suggest connectivity between these groups, at least some exchange of, of, of culture, and if there's exchange of culture, there's probably also exchange of genetics. Right. So there, there's still quite a bit of work to done to be, combine all these different, say, call them lines of evidence. evidence. You have archeological data, fossil data, genetic data, climate data. Um, but these efforts are really beginning to be made, and I think they're, they're picking, painting a much richer picture of, of human history. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave us with a, few, with a few thoughts, a few takeaways from this, parti from this particular uh, paper that I ended on. Um, and it's that human history is much more complex than these simple conceptual models might suggest, which isn't, shouldn't be a huge surprise for anybody, right? Um, you have long-lasting structures, so maybe it's, you might point kind of here, but then there's, but then there's been periodic reshuffling, so it's something, maybe something in between a few of these different concepts, and there's not a, a neat concept for, for how human history occurred. It's more complicated, right? Um, but at least we can, we can start, to, start to tease it apart with, with some careful modeling. Um, and that modeling suggests that we have shared common ancestry all within the past, maybe around 100,000 years. The exact date is is not certain, but it's not, it's not a million years. It's probably not 300,000 years. It's probably closer to 100 or 120,000 years. And the genetic evidence, at least so far, does not support this archaic, admi ad archaic admixture model from a ghost hominin species. Um, but rather, there's regional populations that, that remain, remained closely connected and, and uh, probably all well within what we might consider the envelope of of evolving Homo sapiens. Yeah, and as, as Tom pointed out, there's, um, yeah, excited to, to share this work, um, and it was fun to see it you know, picked up and discussed, and it, it's really exciting when you have your work discuss, discussed by a lot of people. So um, I, hope, I hope everybody here has enjoyed it. I wanna first, first of all thank, thank you. Um, some of the work I highlighted was from Santiago, a student, a student that's jointly in my lab, um, as well as collaborators, my postdoc advisor, Suma, and, um, and at UC Davis, both Brenna and Tim were, were, were closely involved in this project as well. So happy to take any questions. Thanks. <laughs>Thank you, Aaron. That was really, really interesting. Um, I'm wondering how far back you could possibly get genetic um, material to actually get that, that kind of data. Yeah, it depends really sensitively on, well, on the conditions that the fossils were, were kept in. And that, that's not up to us, right? That's, um, you have um, kind of cold, dry locations might preserve fossil data quite or genetic data from fossils quite well. So there's, I think, mitochondrial data from Neanderthals is, I think it dates back a couple hundred thousand years, whereas ancient DNA from fossil remains in, in Africa, not even thinking about those ones that were mapped, but, but among 
population of maybe people living only 10,000 years ago. I think the oldest is 8,000 years or something like that. So it, it doesn't go that far back in time if the conditions aren't great. Right? Um, there might be technological advances that make it more feasible, but I don't know of any right now. And here we go. Very cool talk. Um, uh, your, your math models match the data, but I'm wondering about the ecological pressures, let's say parasites and different food sources, different altitudes, and how those environmental pressures, which we know alter the genome, uh, not alter the genome, but altered selection of the genome, mm -hmm. how that fits into your model. I, I don't get that. And then secondly, what happened 600,000 years ago that those populations crashed in different parts of the world? Uh -huh. Yeah, those are both great questions. So the first question about dealing with selection. So we, if you want to learn about demographic processes, you don't want to be affected by kind of selection messing with the signal of your data. And so we picked seg sequence parts of the DNA, parts of the genome that are far from known functional regions. So we, we picked parts of the genome that are most likely to be evolving somewhat neutrally instead of being under selection. Um, your second question about what was happening around 600,000 years ago, like maybe, or what happened, why is there turnover of populations or this like speciation between humans and Neanderthals or? Ah, the, yeah, so the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. Yeah. So Neanderthals and Denisovans split from Homo sapiens around 600,000, 700,000 years ago. Um, and they went through their own out of Africa event. So Neanderthals are found in, from Western Europe to Siberia. Denisovans, there's fewer fossil remains, but it's thought that, thought that they were in East Asia, maybe the Tibetan Plateau, perhaps Southeast Asia. So they went through their own founder event as they left, as they left Africa. And it, it appears that they maintained kind of why, well, what, it's not quite known, but probably widespread populations at low density. And so they, they were spread across a large geographic range, but maybe in quite small groups. And so their population sizes and if you kind of clump them together, remain quite low. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Yep. No, thanks. Yeah, two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm not clear exactly what you mean by ghost uh, populations. And then a, a more general question, um, how does uh, your research fit in with the much touted uh, and well-publicized uh, work at Star Cave in South Africa? I mean, the university uh, publicity organs made that sound like it was extremely far-reaching what was discovered there. And I'm gleaning from your presentation that that's just one of many sites in Africa where discoveries have been made. Thanks. Yeah, so the first question about why is it called a ghost? So I didn't come up with the term ghost. I, I used it because it's, it's Ghost just refer, refers to unsampled or unidentified, uh, kind of a proxy for we don't know who contributed, but somebody out there that we haven't, haven't sequenced or don't have a fossil representative for yet, quite yet. Um, yeah, so how does this fit into to the work in Rising Star and Homo Naledi? I think, I think there's really exciting work that's being done there. There's, uh, um, an amazing fossil record that has been found there, as, as we've heard about in this series. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of really fascinating questions about um, hominin behavior more broadly, you know, the you know, cognition, uh, kind of all these things that go, into, that go into that and how you infer cognition from artifacts and behavior or, or engravings on the wall, these sorts of things. So I think it may be it's telling a bigger story about um, is, is human behavior all that special, or if it's, if it's evolved multiple times, if, if those results um, suggest that they're, you know, they're, they're also making engravings, a, a, a species that was two million years diverged from, from humans. Mm -hmm. 
so, so they don't quite fit into like the, the historical models that we're inferring, because I don't think they contributed genetically to humans. But they, they maybe fit into these questions of, of what did human evolution even look like over the last couple million years? Was it replicated in other hominin groups that mm -hmm. kind of were evolving in tandem? Um, yeah, so I don't want to throw it out as not, in, as not relevant, <laughs> but, it, but it, it doesn't fit into the models, but I think it's still quite a fascinating question. Mm -hmm. Other questions? So, Aaron, what might be the next thing on the horizon? We've had 30 years of DNA sequencing. Is there anything else bubbling up now, or do we have to wait for something uh, <laughs> that'll be as revolutionary as I think there are a DNA. lot of revolutionary techniques that are coming out in the sequencing world. Um, people are sequen... There are teams, I think, Svante Pablo and, and his teams are, are sequencing DNA from sediments, so without e even having to have a fossil remain if, if humans spent some time and built a hearth in a cave, maybe they left some DNA behind and they're sequencing DNA from sediment, um, sequencing DNA from artifacts, like pendants or these sorts of, or jewelry. Um, so, so there are, techniques are getting more refined of, of being able to get DNA from not just drilling and smashing up a bone, I guess. Um, again, it, they have to be, it still has to be preserved. So it's only going to be certain conditions that preserve it. Um, it would be great if we get DNA evidence from these fossils that have so far not yielded DNA. Um, I don't know what's happening, for example, with Homo naledi. <laughs> that would be very fascinating. Um, I'm not sure. And what might be found by doing more um, frequent total genome sequencing of people from the high variation places in Central and West Africa, living people. Yeah, so, I, so yeah, that's a point that I, that I like to make that I didn't make today, is that all, of the, all the inferences that we made here today, they didn't use any ancient DNA, except that one Neanderthal. We weren't using ancient human DNA. Um, it's, all, it's all inferences made with uh, data from living people. I think there's a lot to still be learned from, from um, just exploring the variation that exists among people living today. And that total number, if I remember right from reading the Nature News article, was 400 folks? It was a couple hundred. A yeah. couple hundred. Mm -hmm. So if you had a couple thousand or 20,000, what would that not help the resolution that much, or might it help significantly? It, it could help in a lot of ways. It could also hurt because um, Whenever you get more data, you have to build the computational capacity to analyze the data. That's where. <laughs> well, that's, that's a synonym where for graduate students. My, oh my goodness. <laughs> some people in my lab are working on you know okay. ways of more efficiently analyzing larger sample sizes. Um, and so the hope is, as the size of data increases, and it's only going to increase the number right. of sequences that are available, that we that we also build the tools to analyze it in a robust way. So it could, the complexity could go up by much more than just the mathematic, the arithmetic going 10x might be 100 times more complicated. Yeah. That um, kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, things tend to explode exponentially. <laughs> and the exponent is big. All right. Any other questions? Got one online, I think. Try to read the ones from the Zoom. Thank you. Uh, were the fossils of East Asia found in Europe? And can we then infer that migration of Neanderthal and East Asia Homo sapiens occurred within a reasonable span of time? Could you repeat that? Sorry. The repeat is, were fossils of East Asia found in Europe? And can we then infer that migration of Neanderthal and East Asia Homo sapiens occurred within a reasonable span of time? Yeah, so we, we know not, even, not only from fossils, but even from, from uh, tracking 
say even the same stone core around that that individuals moved individuals move a lot um, people are very mobile um, so I, I I wouldn't I don't know if this is answering this question all I don't know if I quite understood it but um uh, there there were periods of very rapid expansion um, and it's not, I don't think it's too surprising to find fossils from different, different clades or different groups that coexist in time and space. Um, our resolution for dating things maybe is at the order of hundreds or thousands of years and people might have come and gone and maybe not come into contact or they could have come into contact. I, I, I think things happen in human lives at a much faster time scale than, than our resolution from, from dating fossils. Don't, I don't think I'm answering this question at all. But, um, sorry about that. And here's the second question. Was the size of fossils different in size in different locations? And can we make any inference regarding differences in physical and other characteristics? Yeah, so I think, so there are differences in um, the composition of the fossil record geographically, and so in time, and this might, so one, one reason this might be is because there's changes in population density and locations of, of different groups over time. Um, it also be, could be because there are different differences in the in the um, in the preservation of of, of human rem remains in different places. Um, this, so maybe okay, maybe this answers the question a bit better. If you look across Africa, where there's a, maybe a depletion in the fossil record or, or a higher scarcity in the fossil record compared to places like Europe, um, you don't see much. I don't think you see strong differences in say the the number of archaeological sites. So stone tools don't, are going to be preserved no matter what. And so you see, you see a, lot of, a lot of archaeological sites, just not with the representative fossil along with them. Um, but that does, so it's, it's clear that some humans were there even if we don't have the fossil remains. Um, I wasn't sure what the second part of the question was. Um, I'm not either, but if you'd like to answer any other question that you'd like to have somebody ask you, go ahead. <laughs> Imagine somebody asking the, 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 you know, the, the question that you'd like to be asked that hasn't yeah. been asked yet. <laughs> Let's play wiffle ball. Yeah. Can I call on people? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, any other questions? If not, thank you very much. This is great. As is the tradition, if you'd like to join us next door at the library and come and chat, that'd be great. Or if you want to linger at the lectern and come up and talk to Aaron, that'd be great too. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Hope to see you next week. <laughs>